Matt Hall from Case It Online here with Coach Kleiman. Coach, I'm sure you got plenty you could be doing right now, so I really do appreciate the time. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks for coming in. Um, I just want to spend you know a half hour or so talking about, about football and, and having a conversation with you. The first thing that came to mind for me getting a chance to talk with you is as, as fans and media, we always want to put coaches in a box. So this is the defensive head coach or an offensive head coach. Do you is that a fair label for you being a defensive guy, or do you see yourself as a much more well-rounded than just saying defensive head coach? Uh, well-rounded, I, I hope. I mean, that's my that's my goal. Obviously, I have more understanding and expertise on the defensive side, but I really love visiting with the offensive coaches and yeah. really like sitting in with the quarterbacks and and just kind of giving some of my defensive expertise and just throwing things out there and, and having a different perspective of um, you know. They talk about how they would attack a defense. They yeah. don't want to flip it around and say how a defense would attack an offense. And so, um, you know, I, I think I've, over my time as head coach in the five years, I've really transformed myself in the last couple of years of, of making sure that I'm probably equally offensively and defensively with the staffs. And I'm probably not talking a whole lot of game plan sure. offensively other than, hey, this route combination really hurts this coverage. And then, you know, sometimes Mess and I'll spin off of those conversations. You know, you've had Coach Messingham for a while, and even before him at North Dakota State, ran a, a similar style. I know you're not going to, you know, give away secrets of why you do certain things, but what is about that offensive scheme you wanted to have so part of your program here. well a couple things one wanted to be able to control the football and try to keep uh, high octane offenses on the sideline and, and you know that doesn't mean you're just a run oriented football team that's more you know uh, ball control short passing game some mm -hmm. of those type of things but uh, keep the clock churning so to speak and try to try to shorten games a little bit uh, as far as keeping a great offense on the sideline uh, and the other thing is I, I just wanted to be multiple and try to get as many playmakers as you could involved and that's what I think Courtney's done such a great job of evolving the fact of, you know, somebody would say, boy, you guys run the football, you're a tailback-driven offense. Well, right. if that's the case, we had three and four tailbacks all gain about the same amount of yards as well as uh, a wide receiver that, that uh, had, you know, the highest numbers that Indy Shoes had in a number of, uh, number of years. And so just trying to get your playmakers the football. You mentioned that you guys last year at NDSU had eight or nine hundred rushing yards that came not from running backs, you know. And I know you're going to use players where they best fit. Easton Stick ran for you know over six hundred yards. Is that more of a part of your offense um, than people give it credit for being? Yeah, I think it is, as well as the wide receivers on some of the fly sweeps and right. things like that. Uh, uh, but you also got to be smart. I mean, in with Easton, a lot of those yards probably came either in the red zone or in the playoffs. You're right. Uh, just because you got you, you need to be. It's early September and it's first and ten, and you're scrambling out or you have a designed quarterback run. Get what you can get and get down and get out of bounds so that uh, uh, you can live another down. And and quarterbacks are so hard to find in, at any level yeah. uh, that you don't want to put them you know out there so much that they're taking the, the amount of hits that guys are. But uh, without question, you, you look at it on defense. We always talk about having to defend the 11th man. But if you have to defend a quarterback, either by scrambling around or by design runs, it limits a lot of things you can do defensively. You look at Easton going to the Chargers this year. On the, on the drive over, Derek noted that you've had him and then, of course, Carson Wentz within the last five or so years both go to the NFL. What are some things you look for in quarterbacks? Not – the, not the intangibles we all talk about, but are there some physical things that that you look for specifically in quarterbacks? Well, I want to. I want somebody that's a great leader. I mean, I know that's an intangible sure. thing, but it's something that at the line of scrimmage they they feel comfortable and confident to change a play, to change a protection, to get us into a better play. Uh, and and we were able to do that even with Skyler uh, late in spring, uh, and uh, so that he started to feel comfortable with that because real in reality. Uh, our best offense is typically when the quarterback can get to the line of scrimmage and say, we've designed this against this front, we've designed this against this front, get us in the correct play. And so that's probably the number one uh, intangible and then toughness. You know, sure. I, I want somebody that's that's physically and mentally tough, um, that it's it's third and three in the third quarter and there's nothing there, and I find a way to get three and a half. You know, that's what you're hoping for as a, as a physically tough kid. And then mentally tough as far as, you're going to make a mistake. You know, Carson threw interceptions, Easton threw interceptions. You just don't let that play beat you. You move on to the next play and, and, and try to be mentally strong because uh, 60 minutes is a long course of a football game to, right. make, to make plays. Sticking on offense, you guys get in here and you have essentially no returning scholarship backs with Alex going to the NFL and, and Mike's medical issues. You've added now, depending on how you count it, anywhere from six to eight, you know, six that are obvious. And then, you know, Jackson, he could probably play some running back. Tyler Burns was on scholarship and came back. 
Uh, was that the biggest goal? Is like we need to get some depth in the backfield when you got here and looked at this roster? Yeah, that was probably the first thing that we talked about. There were some other positions that were probably a little bit thin that uh, probably are still a little bit sure. thin. But the running back position with the multitude of guys that we have been playing back there in this style of offense, there's times where there's uh, three guys on the field at once and oftentimes two uh, that we needed to try to find multiple guys that could help us. And, and the other thing that uh, – I'm a big believer in is your running backs should be should be some of your best special teams guys. Right. Uh, and if you're playing multiple guys and guys are getting whether it's 10 to 14 carries a game and 20 to 25 plays on offense, they ought to be able to play 20 to 25 plays on special teams. And so uh, that that was a big focal point as we went into recruiting. Obviously, James was the first one we brought in here yeah. um, in January, and then with the freshman, and then always having the idea that we needed to have another older guy uh, to come and ensure that up for another year and then of course if you can talk about him you know, Jordan Brown's a guy who you get in in May at this late in the game you wouldn't think you could find a back who basically started as a sophomore at Carolina and and they've spoken incredibly highly of him even after he's left so how did that situation situation play out and you got a, uh, to get a second back like yeah that we just have, have always been looking for one you know ever since January we had talked about this as a staff that uh, uh, we weren't thinking we're going to get through the whole season with with the kids currently on the roster as well as true freshmen that we wanted to try to continue to look out there we weren't going to reach for one but it just would it be the right fit within our offense and uh, I think coach Anderson came to us with Jordan you know a month ago and um, maybe not not even that long and just started some conversations and uh ended up he was a really good fit for what we're trying to do and uh, I'm still excited about the Harry Trotters and the Tyler sure. Burns and and those guys that I think really can help us and, and and showed some things in the spring but we also have been in this offense long enough to know that you you need to have three to five guys uh, that can carry the ball a significant amount of times and, and play on all those teams. To flip to the de defensive side we've talked about you being more of a well-rounded guy but um, I'm sure as competitive as you and Coach Hazleton are, is there some excitement to know you're coming into the league that it could be the best offensive league in college football um, to have that kind of challenge facing you guys? Yeah, it, it really is. Uh, and from afar, I noticed how how talented the Big 12 was uh, as I've continued to, to learn and investigate uh, offenses are obviously really prolific. The quarterback position is such a dynamite position in this league. And then the skill kids, especially outside, the the, the long, fast, lean, wide receivers right. that uh, can go up and make plays, uh, trying to find a way to, you know, do some different things coverage-wise to try to take somebody away. And um, I, I'm excited because – uh, Coach Hayes and I have gone way back. We worked together in 2011, and I've seen how he's evolved with some of the things that he was doing, whether it was with Jacksonville when he was with the Jags or with Wyoming. And they you know, it's kind of evolved from where we were at in 2011 together. Um, a lot of the same philosophies of what we're trying to get accomplished. It's still uh, limiting mistakes and not giving up big plays and being really aggressive tacklers yeah. and not being just a read and react defense, but an upfield penetrating disruptive defense. Defense. You've played, you know, at North Dakota State a number of Big 12 offices. Of course, you played here. You beat Iowa State. You beat Kansas. You beat Iowa Big Ten team, of course. But my question I'm getting to is you've had a lot of success going against these offenses. The detractors will say, well, yeah, in one-game scenarios, yep. you know, you can do that. Is that something that you buy into, that it's, you know, one game doesn't really prove it? But I'm sure you still take a lot of pride in what you did against those, oh, those offenses. Oh, shoot. I think they were – between Craig Bull and myself, it was 8-0 right. against uh, – uh, power five opponents and that's hard to that's hard to do uh but no i understand that if we were playing that at north dakota state and playing this the gauntlet that that sure. everybody plays it'd be it'd be difficult um especially with 63 scholarships and not 85 I, i'm not big into you know what would be what could be sure. uh, i just play what's in front of you and uh that's the schedule that's laid out just like you know people talk about boy aren't you excited about this game or that game no i'm excited about getting into the summer continuing to improve and getting ourselves ready to play nickel state you mentioned craig bull um, we've written and read a lot other places about your leadership thoughts and your coaching thoughts i'm curious whether it's craig bull or somebody else is there a coach somewhere in your past who led in a totally different way than you, but you still like looked up to and can take something from? Well, I, I learned from so many different coaches and not just head coaches, yeah. a lot of assistant coaches as well. And I was one of those guys that, that moved around a lot as a younger coach. So I had a number of different guys to learn from. I played for three college coaches when I was at Northern Iowa yeah. and, and, and 
another great learning experience there. And so not in particular one, obviously my, my time with Craig was great. It was only three years, um, but uh, I, I picked his brain and learned an awful lot for him, learned a lot from Terry Allen, uh, Randy yeah. Ball, a number of guys that, that, that were head coaches, Mark Farley and stuff. But I, I, I all more the assistants because I was a lifetime assistant until I had the opportunity to go and be the head coach after I was defensive coordinator uh, at, at North Coast State. And I just always had – maintain really good relationships with with the assistant coaches scott frost and i are really good friends Mm -hmm. mainly because we were on the staff together for a couple of years uh at northern iowa and boy does that help you when when you need to lean on somebody and ask somebody a question and stuff of of just building all those relationships when you're assistants it's interesting you you say you talk about that you were kind of a career assistant for a long time did you always still want to be a head coach or was there ever a point where you said oh this is great i'm a coordinator and i'm happy and and it was that fire always still there. Yeah, no, I always wanted to be a head coach, and I always wanted to learn as much as I could about that. And that's that's easier said than done yeah. as a defensive coordinator when you're trying to game plan, game plan, game plan, and you kind of you forget about all the things that a head coach has to do. And I was always just trying to have that stuff on the back burner of listening to see what some of the head coaches that I worked for had to do and, and how they handled situations, how they handled media, how they handled fan bases, how they handled the travel, whatever it may right. be, game planning, as well as, um, you know, having that you know, the common common th- uh, theme of spending enough time on football-related things so you don't become strictly a CEO. Yeah. And that's what I didn't want to do is – I still love coaching um, the nickels. Uh, Coach Hayes lets me take the nickels in a meeting or, or out on the field. I love still coaching that aspect of it, and I didn't want to give that up and just say, nope, I'm just going to be a CEO and, and stay yeah. with the topic because I think um, still my best attribute is the relationships I have with the players. You talked about um, all that you know goes into being a coach outside of just game planning and that kind of stuff. We sat here with not here, but a similar setting with Bruce Weber about six months ago. And I asked him, why do you let us talk to your assistant so much? And he kind of looked at me like, well, I want to be a head coach someday. They need to handle that kind of stuff. Is that the same line of thinking for you why you make them all so accessible to us? Yeah, I, I want those experiences. And um, I had some of those experiences, not a ton, but I had some of those experiences when I was an assistant coach or a, or a coordinator. And I know how much I grew from them. And I want what's best for, for our assistants. If it can help their themselves professionally, if it can help their family, um, I've been there, and right. I want those guys to have opportunities. And uh, obviously, the more success you have, the more opportunities you're going to have. Uh, but the more uh, more coaches get along, the more cohesive a staff is, the more opportunities for that staff. Because players see everything, coaches see everything. I really think media sees everything. Sure. They see how people get along, and I think that's really important that uh, you 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 portray that and you let those guys. Be a part of it so they don't say, well, it's always this coach that gets interviewed. I don't yep. want them all to be out in front of it. <laughs> um, unrelated, but I'm fascinated with the idea of how of how you build a roster and build a program. So when you when you get here, um, do you go to the detail of like putting all the positions on the board and saying, I wish we had X scholarships here at this different classes? Like how detailed can you get with that from the jump? And do you have super specifics yeah. at all those spots you want yeah. to get to? It takes some time. Yeah. But, and we're still, it's still a work in progress. You know, I, I think it's been about four months. Yeah. And we're still, you know, Taylor Bratt and I are still looking at things of where do we, what do we have to do uh, at this position? How many more scholarships? How many more walk ons do we need at a specific position? Um, and, and so you're not going to do that in the first spring. You typically probably aren't going to do that in the first year, even though you want to have. Uh, specifics of I need to get this many guys and this many guys based on our style of play uh, at positions. It's an ongoing fluid process. And then you have a situation like a Mike McCoy. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe it's a different position. All of a sudden, wait a minute, we were really healthy and good at that position. And all of a sudden, we have one kid medical and another kid walk away from football because he doesn't like it anymore. And another kid get in, gets injured and you're like, holy cow, now, right. now you're down three three spots there. Okay, where do we pick from? How do we – and we're always tinkering with, hey, we're going to try you at a different position in spring ball, and not because we think you are a different position, but we're always trying to think one step ahead. Okay, what happens if somebody goes down? Who can we move to a different spot to try to still shore up some things? So it's it, – it's, a, a roster is so fluid because there's there is unfortunately a lot of attrition on a sure. year-to-year basis. You mentioned style of play kind of fitting into that. Is there any advantage built in 
to really needing positions like you know tight end, H back, full back, even tailback to an extent in a different way than the other nine programs are using them. Can you recruit maybe a higher level of athlete at those positions than maybe otherwise if they were more popular throughout college football? Yeah, I think and, and I think Bill did the same thing. Try to develop guys. Yeah. Try to find the long, lean athlete that's six foot four, six foot five, two hundred ten to two hundred thirty pounds, and see what happens. See where his body goes because ultimately you have a couple. Out, you can be a tight end in our offense. You can be an offensive lineman in our offense. You can be a defensive tackle. You can be a defensive end. We need more of those body types. Yeah. That uh, uh, and they're out there. And but they're not five stars. Sure. They're not even four stars. Some of them aren't even three stars. Right. There's a kid named Carson Wentz that was a six foot six hundred ninety pound kid yeah. that nobody knew what was going to be or what he was going to become. Those are the ones you have to find, and that's where your you know, your evaluations, your recruiting uh, staff, your your camps, whatever it may be, where nobody knows about somebody, and all of a sudden you see him and you think, wow, that guy's got a chance. You know it's not going to be next year. Yeah. And sometimes it's going to be two and three years, and that's I, I, I learned that from Coach Bull as far as taking as many of those type of kids as you can and if you can get a bunch of those kids, they may not be playing to their redshirt sophomore, redshirt junior year, but they're ready to go when they get to that point. The hard thing with recruiting right now is if I recruit you and say maybe you're redshirt junior year before you're playing, you're like, I'm not going to your school then. Yep. And that's where recruit, recruiting is so fluid. With, with recruiting, and this may just be me getting older to see this, and you can tell me I'm wrong, but it felt like 10, 20 years ago, um, at least from a recruiting and reporting perspective, there was a pretty clear separation between player 50 and player 250. Now, it seems like player 100 and player 400, there may be, a, you know, not that big of a difference between their potential. Is, are there more good players available than there were 15 or 20 years ago? Is that just me getting older in perception? Um, you know, I, I don't know where the rankings were, and I'm sure. not a big rankings guy. I, I, I always look at, do they fit our system? Do they fit our offense, fit our defense, fit our culture? Um, but, but you're right. I, I think, you know, you look at our – class of 2019 well i hope those guys really aren't judged until about 2021 of course yeah Yeah, but everybody's boy how many of these guys are going to play and make huge impacts as true freshmen well you hope a few especially because of the four game rule that we have now but the likelihood the more true freshmen you have an impact i I don't think your program's real healthy unless you're uh, a place like clemson or, or alabama that Guys are staying there three years and out. They're yeah. they're gone. Um, that's that's the hard thing is, uh, uh, you know, I, I I don't know if player one hundred to four hundred, but if player four hundred fits what we're doing, I never knew that he was four hundred. You could right. have said, boy, you could have had one hundred and four uh, four hundred fit us better. Right. I just have a couple more that I'm I'm curious about. I want to know from a like a goal setting perspective. I, I, one, do you will you go to the point of literally making goals for the season of winning? You know making this bowl game or X amount of games, uh, will you do that? And then two, how challenging is that? To not set a goal that's too attainable, but also not put something out there that's probably unrealistic to reach. Yeah, I think uh, all result-driven goals um, can get you in trouble. Uh We're more process-based goals. Um, You know, and we've done this at, at North Dakota State every year I was there, of come up with goals, and I did it with the seniors and stuff. And it was all based on, you know, uh, better communication, holding each other accountable, uh, making sure that, uh, um, you know, we watch X amount of film. We're, we're not, not taking any opponent for granted. Those type of goals, as well as what are we going to do as far as watch extra film, do an extra workout for the guys on their own. To say, boy, we're going to win X amount of games, or um, that's no different than, uh, boy, we circle this game. Man, exactly. this is our game. Well, what are you going to do those other 11 weeks right. out of the season? How do you get those kids motivated for the ele- other 11 if you're circling? And I was a part of that as far as people circled North Dakota State. Man, that is the game. Well, those were hard because you're tar- you're, there was a target on your back every week. And that's what we always talked about is just embrace the target on your back. You're a college athlete, period. There's a target on your back anymore because they're wanting to see what mistakes you make and stuff. Yeah. Embrace that target on your back and, and attack that process and stack good day upon good day upon good day. And if you stack enough of those good days, especially Monday through Friday, you're going to be successful on Saturday. If you're worried about the game Saturday on Monday of how we're going to execute it, we're not going to be very successful. We better figure out how we can get through Monday to get better for Tuesday and so on. My last question 
question is just about you, and it's, it might be tough off the top of your head, but what's a part of your job, you know, like an off the radar, you know, outside the box part of your job that you wake up in the morning and you think, I'm excited to get to do that? Like, what's a detail that maybe some people wouldn't think about that you love doing? I, I think just, and I, and I have this thought every day, impact someone on a daily basis. Yeah. You know, that's, well, what do you mean impact? It impacts someone on a daily basis, whether I'm down in the locker room, down in the weight room, over at the performance center, grabbing somebody and talking to that talking to that young man about something academically, uh, something in their life, a, a, a hobby they have, impacts someone on a daily basis. And that's something that uh, I strive to do. And, and Ben Newman, um, who's a performance coach, right. taught me that. He's like, that's our number one goal right now is impacting people on a daily basis. And if you can get a bunch of them, and during the season you hope you do that, but during the off season that's sometimes difficult. You don't see them that much, but how can I impact somebody on a daily basis? Well, thank you, Coach. I really do appreciate the time. Uh, best of luck this year, and look forward to watching your team, your team play on the field. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me.